Today, I am joined by John Lindsay. He's the co-founder and president of Lindsay Self Storage. He is also the author of the forthcoming book, The Sexy Side of Self Storage, an insider's guide to a necessity, a necessary commodity. The sexy John Lindsay, welcome to the podcast. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. Psyched we can finally reconnect, albeit over Zoom today. Absolutely. It it's better than nothing, right? Yeah, that's right, man. <laughs> So I have to ask you first about the title of the book. I know a lot of times it's the publisher who comes up with the title, but I have to assume I, I've known you long enough. You played some sort of role in this title. So I, I told them, I said, look, you know, we have to throw sexy in the title. I was like, I don't care where it is. And I said, <laughs> because storage, you know, let's be honest, it's not, it's not sexy on its front. It's not like I own a building in downtown Atlanta on Main and Main. And I'm like, Hey, that's my building. Like, no one's ever been like, wow, that is a sexy looking storage facility. But the business itself is very attractive, great return. So we said, hey, let, let's let's do a nice little spin on this, get some attention, get some people interested and buy the book. So, uh, yeah, I had a little bit to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not surprising, man. So I always like to start with this podcast talking about how people grew up because I think that's such an interesting I, – I think – just knowing where people come from tells you a lot about where they are and, and how they think. So talk to me a little bit about how you grew up. I know your dad was in self-storage. Yep. What role did that play? Uh, obviously played a big role in, in your yeah. career, but but what were you doing as a kid? So I'll tell you, so I was born in Dallas, Texas. We moved to Durham, North Carolina when I was like a year old. So North Carolina is home for all intents and purposes. Um, my father got into the storage business in 1969 he was a developer. He was helping people build storage facilities all over the U.S. So I grew up pouring concrete and running slab and going to job sites with him and, you know, worked in the desk during the summer in high school. And I, I knew I was absorbing all this information. Like when I was in college and real estate classes, I realized that I, I knew a lot about storage and I felt kind of ahead of my curve and was like, hmm, there's something here, but I wasn't really quite sure what it was. And coming through my senior year of college, I just knew I was not destined to work for someone else. I have the attention yeah. span of a goldfish. I was just like, this is not, I know the feeling, man. This is not for me. So I said, dad, you know, I really want to get into storage, but I don't want to build facilities. It's just not my cup of tea. And, and my dad is, is older. He's 55 years older than me. So he had stopped building a decade before I got out of college. And he's like, look, I'll help you in through introductions, anything like that. He's like, but you're on your own. So my senior year of college, I went out and did million dollar raise started Lindsay Self Storage Group, and we now are a self-storage brokerage firm. We help people buy and sell storage facilities all over the US, Europe, and Asia. So I said, hey, I don't want to waste all this knowledge I had. Let's apply it in a way to help people maximize their value in selling their companies. Um, much better fit for my personality. I love talking to people all day long, and thankfully, that is what I now get to do. So yeah. instead of watching concrete dry, I help people sell their storage facilities. I, I was going to say, I was going to comment on that when you were talking about pouring concrete as a kid, because my dad grew up in construction, and when I was growing up, he made me, like, he was always working on a project, and he made me get up early and, and pour concrete and chop wood and whatever, because he wanted to scare me into going to college. Like, he wanted me to not want to do any of that kind of manual labor that's, shit. That's what my dad, he goes, my dad, you know, he is a typical, like, boomer generation, self-made, self-taught, put his head down and just worked, worked, worked until it happened and it worked for him. And he, you know, he played college football and he says to this day, he's like, I wouldn't have graduated college if I didn't play football. And he goes, you will have the best education. You will go to college. He goes, and then we can talk about what you want to do after. So yeah. very similar. He was like, yeah. there's no, like, if you're going to school right. and he goes, you will go to school. He's like, I did not work this hard for you to not go to school. Right. So you, I, I feel it. Were you like, were you a motivated student though? Because I like, for me, it was like, it was always, it felt like a burden. I was just like, I never wanted to be in school. I was always getting in trouble. So I, don't, I was a, I was a healthy mix. I was, I was naturally gifted in school. So like I always right. did well enough. Exactly. But didn't like, I never cared to be like the A plus yeah. student. I was always like B's, you know, low A's and I got by with it, but I really liked like participating in class. Like I definitely liked knowing the answer and stuff, but I was never like, I don't need to, you know, try that hard. And I did, I did really well. And I went to a yeah. great college and did very well for myself. And but, you know, my brother, on the, my younger brother, he's the wizard in the family. He's the kid who sits in the back row, would sleep through class and gets 100 on everything. He just, like, absorbs like a sponge. So, yeah. you know, I, I would consider myself 
gifted in school, but he's like the wizard. So right, um, right. I feel I feel dumb in relation to the rest of my family. <laughs> well, that's kind of like I, I was I was very much like you. Know, I was like I, I I could do well enough without really trying that I could get by and, and still still goof off or whatever. And uh, my sister was like the straight A student, 4.0s all the time. And then my brother, I think, was like a mix of the two of us because he because he was very social and personable, but he also got good grades. So we... yeah, well, and that's my brother was like national chess team, yeah. national debate team, state champion track star. Like, so it's funny. We had this like really funny mix. We both do well in school, but he excelled here. I excelled in sports. Like it was just kind of, <laughs> right, right. I know it was a good mix, but we had a great time growing My dad was so influential in getting us to where we are and I know everyone's going to say this about their parents, but my dad's the hardest working guy I know. He just blood, sweat, and tears into providing us with everything that he did not have as a kid. And I think like, well, not, I think I know that my dad is the reason for who I am today. And I would not be here without him. Plain and yeah. Did you, when you were growing up, were you always thinking like you were going to follow in his footsteps? Did he want you to follow in his footsteps or when did that kind of come into play? So it was always a conversation of, you know, I, I, uh, I, my dad was very, let's see, he let me do kind of whatever I want, Grip, as long as I did well in school and stayed out of trouble. So whether it was going on trips with friends or like um, school abroad experiences or this and that. And he was like, look, I'm going to let you have these experiences. I didn't have these as a kid. He goes, but you have to stay out of trouble and you have to do well in school. Like very simple rules, but he wanted me to experience so much more than what he had growing up. And he definitely made me be appreciative of that though. And believe me, I was, I was corrected a couple of times growing up as a kid, but it was always a, a like, Hey, this is why I don't approve of this. And this is why you should be going this way. And, you know, he always said, John, I know that you want this lifestyle when you get older and you want to be able to provide for your family and have flexibility. He goes, you could go do whatever you want. And I, and I, I'll let you go do it. He goes, but the one thing that I know how to teach you is, is self-storage because I, I, I don't know, you know, computers and a math and a science he gets, but I'm really good at self-storage. And if you want a career path that you can excel in, he's like, I can teach you as much as you want in this space. And so I, I was able to be around just this, you know, rough, gritty storage developer who had seen it all over 40 years and, and really just absorb everything that he had to offer. And, you know, my dad turns 87 this year. He still comes into my office three or four days a week. God bless him. Yeah, wh whether we like it or not, he's, yeah. he's in the office <laughs> picking through my files and um, honestly, just kind of like an encyclopedia of knowledge. And yeah. it's great. So my brother and I have taken this rough coal that my father has mined and, and you know, squeezed it into the diamond that we have today. But we wouldn't know how to do that without him. I mean, he yeah. is truly really the foundation of everything we have. So, so thankful for those experiences growing well, up. And and it when you talk to people, it's so rare that you have that kind of healthy relationship with with father and son, you know, because you, you meet so many people who their dad makes them follow in their footsteps, or yeah. they they're kind of like they they've got nowhere else to go, so they just kind of fall into it. But it sounds like I you guys think... had such a great relationship that you really wanted it. He had this healthy relationship where he said, "I'm going to show you the ropes, but not push you into it." Yeah. Well, I think because he was so much older than me. I mean, it, yeah. kind of like a, a grandfather. I mean, you got to think when I'm. 15 years old, dad's 70. I mean, yeah. you know, so it was just kind of like a, and he was so family focused that time. He was kind of already on the tail end of his career. So he had time, he had patience. And also it was never like, no, you can't do that because I'm your parent. It was like, John, I'd rather you not do this. And here's the reason why right. I was always treated as an adult. I was talked to as an adult. My expectations were also that of an adult. So from an early age, my father really brought me into the fold of conversation and major decisions and rewarded me as such by allowing me flexibility and, and, you know, wanting to explore different avenues, whether in sports or travel or languages or whatever it was. But there was, there were expectations set to me from an early age and, but I was treated like an adult. And I think that that really helped me out at an early age. And, and he really spent time explaining why I needed to appreciate the opportunities, experiences I had. And, you know, my dad was, let's see, six years old when, his his father was captured as a prisoner of war in world war ii wow. so my dad like i'm growing up with this firsthand stories of you know the great depression and not having you know money to eat bread or turn on your power and you know his dad's over in a pow camp in germany for three years and i'm just like i'm hearing this firsthand whereas you know, usually you might hear it secondhand from a grandparent or a story but like that was just kind of like my barometer as a kid and although i grew up in a totally different lifestyle 
my dad was like, you're not going to forget this and you're going to appreciate this. Yeah. And so from an early age, I was just kind of, I don't want to say forced down my throat, but I, sure. I heard it often. Yeah. How did you fit into the, the self-storage industry? Like to me, when I hear self-storage industry, like, everyone thinks like kind of boring and whatever. Yeah. When, when I look at you, I think, oh, this guy's, he's a sports agent or he's, you know, something flashy. <laughs> And so like, it, I can like, what well, like just yeah. my experience, you know, when I was working at a law firm, people were like, wow, you work at a law firm. I don't believe it. Cause my personality like didn't really match that industry. And they were actually right. Like I really didn't belong there. I really wasn't happy there. But for you, how do you make that square peg fit into that round hole? So it, it's so funny you say that. I, I talk about my book and I've talked about it probably every keynote address I've ever given. I showed up to like my first storage conference with like you know, hot green socks and bow tie and custom suit. And I, you know, that's, that's just always been my thing. I like funky colors and patterns and, you know, and everyone's just kind of like, who's this kid? You know, the average age, like 65 year old farmer Joe in the corner. Right. And here I am, you know, budding ball of energy. And um, I, it was welcome though, because that's, that's who I am. You know, right. I, I like wearing bright colors and rocking bow ties and, you know, so it, it took people a minute to figure out if I was legit or not, I think. And, you know, at 22, when I first went to these conferences, there was a lot of fake it till you make it, you know, yeah. sitting in on conversations and at tables and just kind of, you know, nodding and patiently listening and figuring it out. And, and once I, you know, obviously got my footing and set the company off, you know, it's still a learning process to this day, but yeah, early on it was, um, you know, but I think it first clicked when um, I was at a conference and someone came up and they're like, are you John Lindsay? And I was like, yeah, why? They're like, oh, someone told me to look for the guy with bright socks and a bow tie. <laughs> yeah. And so now you business. will not see me in right. any photo without a bow tie or <laughs> some custom jacket or something on. And it's just kind of become my thing. You, over you the created years. your own brand. I, we have. I mean, it's, yeah. it's definitely been our MO and uh, you'll see on the cover of the book. You'll see it at every conference I'm at. And and my brother, same thing. We wear bow ties everywhere we go. So it's it's kind of hard to miss us at a trade show. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, we definitely own it to this day. That's for sure. <laughs> and actually, the, now that I think about it, like in some ways, uh, explain this to me. So when I was growing up, when you see self-storage facilities, like just driving down the highway on the side of the road, it was always just these older kind of rundown places like the barbed wire fence. Yep. Now – I'll drive down the road and I'll see like I th I'll think they're building a hotel, but it's actually a new self storage facility. These big gorgeous facilities and and you'll see bright colors and and yeah. every like brick and what can you explain to me that like what's happened in the last it, 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 is that true is that an industry wide oh, thing you, you nailed it so okay. what happened storage used to be considered like the redheaded stepchild in the back of the industrial park like like you said gravel drives old crappy buildings barbed wire fence you know like. I don't want to drive there in the middle of the day, let alone at night. Right. And through the 2000s, we saw our first wave of like private equity, high level Wall Street money really dump into storage. And there's always been a couple brands that have really done that. Like public storage has been around forever. But, you know, first like Wall Street major attention from family offices, hedge funds and stuff like that. And since then, especially through like 20, like 2008, 2011, storage killed it during the recession. It like absolutely crushed it which gave more of the stamp on it. And then through the 2010s, uh, we saw billions and billions and billions of dollars of private capital pour into the space. And people started building more infill, more class A, main and main locations. Um, I mean, like we had a client in Vancouver, Canada, build a site main and main. They sold it for $42 million, one location. So, I mean, like there are some crazy priced assets out there. But you're right. They look like their office or industrial or um, office or medical or things like that now, and they have to be to get the zoning approvals. But for also what they're trying to charge in that corner, they have to have a quality of product associated with them. Um, but I think it's interesting you note that because last year, in the midst of the global pandemic, where everything went to hell in a handbasket, storage had one of its best years ever. And in October, we saw Bill Gates buy into the storage industry to the tune of 2.7 billion dollars. And then Blackstone made a $1.2 billion investment in the storage space in the midst of a global pandemic. Right. So we saw the double rubber stamp last year in That's 2020, incredible. a year that we will never forget in the history of our lives. Um, so storage is, is on fire right now. It's crazy. What explains that? Is it just because people's lives are so up in the air now that there's just more people putting stuff so in storage? It's uncertainty bodes very well for storage. And yeah. that can be a good or a bad thing. So let's take 
2020, you know, let's say you're working from home, you still have your job. All of a sudden you and your wife are like, you know what? We have this great time on our hands. Let's redo the kitchen. We've been dying to do it for years. Well, move everything out and you put it in storage. On a, a less than pleasant note, let's say you move your, you lose your job, you got to move or you got downsized to so your renting instead of owning. Well, you got to put stuff in storage. So times of uncertainty, both good and bad, bode well for storage. Well, last year we saw a lot of uncertainty. Um, so through that, we saw storage perform very well when none of the other real estate asset classes were, were doing very well at all. Retail, office, just depleted, man. Talk about letting the air out of the balloon. It was a rough year for those asset classes. And hospitality, forget about it. And so one of the only asset classes that not only did well, but thrived during it, investors said, okay, we need to double down on this, not only to cover our losses and other classes, but it did so well that we want to dump even more money into the asset class and continue to further our investments there moving forward. Huh. So um, it was a wild year of investments for storage, to say the least. I bet. I bet. And are you seeing that trend kind of continuing or is it going to drop off, do you think, with the, the pandemic quieting so down? I think it's twofold. One, debt is still so cheap that, yes, we're seeing a lot of wild money getting thrown at the space right now and a lot of new entrants and things like that. Um, which is good. It solidifies the fact that storage is a healthy class A asset class, period. But um, I think we could both agree there's some probably looming inflation that's going to hit at some point. I think we're already feeling it in the market, but actually to see it implemented is another. Um, so with the changing debt, we'll see how that affects the storage market. Um, and then also as office and retail and all that comes back, we'll see what the impact of that is on dollars invested in storage. But you know, it's funny because without the pandemic, a lot of people in the industry were thinking that 2020 would be kind of a, a tapering year. We saw record construction for like four years in a row. So we were kind of waiting for a burn off. And then, you know, 2020 was like Vin Diesel hit the NOS button and storage just launched into the stratosphere. So right. it was, um, it was crazy. But I think, you know, again, it's, it's all calculated risk because debt's so cheap. We just, it's so easy to, you know, buy a deal at a five cap when you're getting debt at, you know, two and a half percent. It's crazy. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I've seen, you know, you do a lot of speaking on this stuff. You go to a lot of conferences and I know you've spoken like even internationally. Yep. How did you, how did you get in that position to be featured at these conferences at such a young age? And is there kind of like a Dane Cook effect where like other comedians hated Dane Cook because he got so successful so young and he was the star of everything. Do you, do you get that from the industry? Do you know the older guys I, like kind of Get upset that, well, that you get these I'm, center I stage. I hope I'm not hated. I think I definitely <laughs> step on some toes there. We, our firm has grown very quickly in the past decade, and um, we we tout with all the big publicly traded brokerage firms. Um, so might maybe a little bit of brush and shoulders, but um, it's really it was very organic climb to get there. I started you know very low level with some state associations, volunteering for committees, and eventually getting on the boards and being the president of those. And then from there, I you know, got on the national board of directors and then started doing some keynote at the national level. And then we started doing some work in Europe. And then I like I speak German. And so then from there, they're like, oh, this is great. You understand Europe, you understand storage. Would you speak at this event? And then started doing work in Asia. And then they're like, oh, you spoke in Europe and the States. We'd like you to speak in Asia now. So uh, it's been super fun, man. Yeah. Like it, It's been awesome. And I, and I love it. I mean, you, I'm sure you can tell, I, I love talking. It's a ton of fun. So they're like, give me a mic and throw you on stage. I'm like, you don't yeah, have to tell awesome. me. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'll talk all day. So we've done, let's see, we did Hong Kong, Shanghai, um, and then obviously all the US shows and Paris and Berlin and Amsterdam. It, it's just been, it's been a ton of fun, man. I, I absolutely love it. Um, and it gives me an excuse to work in my languages too. Yeah. So I'm, I'm all about it. Oh, that's cool. How yeah, does the industry translate in places like Hong Kong where there's so much less land? Like, is it, is it similar? So, Are you talking about the same stuff? Yes and no. So it's interesting because like Asian self-storage is a bit of the wild west. Um, I think we can all agree there's a very different political landscape in a lot of Asian countries compared to the U.S. Um, so there's always the, the, the looming fear that the government just comes in and takes your business for shits right. and giggles. Right. Um, but instead of like owning land like you do here in the U.S., a lot of Europe and Asia is a lot of land lease plays and building leases, um, much shorter terms, but much higher rent. Um, I think also something very interesting, like we're doing a project in Vietnam right now, and they have a, a very large growing middle class um, and kind of very similar to what China went through a few years ago with that, that shift. And 
it's almost like a trend. It's cool that you are making enough money to afford storage space for your stuff. Yeah. So they're like, hey, I'm doing well enough that I can buy excessive stuff that I don't necessarily need and I can afford to put it in storage. So it, it's kind of a cool yeah. market to be in and to watch that happen. And obviously there's much more mature markets over there like Tokyo and Singapore and Taipei. Um, Hong Kong storage has been around for a while, but you know, Shanghai, Beijing, Chengdu, and then getting into like, like India is starting to get a, a wave of storage facilities now. And like, you know, Vietnam, this is the third project in Vietnam of, of actual, you know, quality size, I would say. Um, so it's cool, man. I love it. Like, I just, yeah. I love traveling. I love learning new cultures. I love learning new languages and getting an opportunity to share storage with other people and watch it kind of grow from its infancy is pretty awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. I want to talk about entrepreneurship like generally because you know you you have this entrepreneurial personality and it just like you exude it. Do you think without having your dad's background it's always hard to play this game because it's hard to, to play the counterfactual without knowing but you know if you didn't have your dad there kind of showing you the ropes if you didn't know anything about self storage would you have found your way to starting your own company somewhere do you think? I think absolutely. I, I, I don't know what it would have been, but I definitely would have. And as we talked about earlier, I have the attention span of the goldfish, right. even though storage is my, my main focus. Uh, we're invested in a number of different asset classes. And, and, you know, I pretty much will look at anything that comes across my desk, whether it's crypto, we've got startup lab, invested in a tech company. I mean, I, I've looked at anything, you name it. And I'll pretty much, there's a story to be told, I'll take a run at it. Um, and I think that's just kind of part of it. It's all calculated and finding the right teams and finding the, the specialty within those classes. But I mean, my brain just naturally goes to like, all right, how do we make a business out of this? Like, is right. there something to be capitalized on here? And I, I love it. Like, yeah. I, I think that is half the fun is honestly putting the deal together. You know, I tell people all the time, like I, as much as I love deals closing, I like the, when it actually closes is not the excitement for me. It's like the chase of putting it together and finding the buyer and finding the seller. And just like in starting other new ventures, it's like the selling the story and putting the, the capital and raising it and, you know, structuring the whole deal and creating the battle plan. Like that's half the fun. And I think that is ultimately what I love. Just like that, that chase of creating some new type of product or asset class. It's so much fun. I, I really wouldn't want to be doing anything else. Yeah. And I, I feel like that probably can't be taught. Do you think you're just born with that, that I don't know, feeling? I, I would say, I, I think, yes. There's some type of feeling in your bones that's like, I, like this is not, I'm, I'm not supposed to just stop here. Yeah. And I think it's the same for athletes or anything else where you're like, you excel in whatever you're good at. You have this thing that says, I don't want to be status quo. I, right. if this is the line. I want to go above it. And it's not like a, a thing of like, oh, I'm better on this. It's like just this inner drive. And it's funny because like my, the people I try, I try and surround myself with and be around are people who also want to go do things like that. Just like if you were really into, you know, CrossFit, you're a gym, right. you're going to go more and you're hanging out with guys who love CrossFit. And so I've been fortunate enough to surround myself with like-minded business people and people who want to toss around ideas and start new ventures and you know, go do cool shit together. Are you still, for people who don't know, I know John through CrossFit yeah. Durham. Yeah, that's are, you still, yeah. are you still CrossFitting? Oh yeah. Five okay, days great. a week, man. That's oh, what awesome. better. Yeah. That, that's what, that's what calms this all day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that's, I say that all the time when I say I need to work out or else my brain just goes nuts. It's, it's I'm, I'm a miserable therapy. human being yeah. without it in my life. And you know, David Goggins always talks, it's like mental callousing yep. and it's true, man. Like the gym is, is where I get all my yayas out and I yeah. get refocused and recentered and i think it's a it's a it's a physical and mental grind every day and yeah. that's what it's there for yeah and that's i i guess it, it ties into what i was asking before is because people ask me like you know how do i start working out how do i start doing this i i don't know how to give you the advice that works for me because for me it's i have to make myself go or else I'm, i go nuts if you don't have that in you it's I, it's probably a lot harder to motivate yourself what you know i i tell people so i started working out when i was 15 I was a very late bloomer. I was I was overweight, was super short for my group friends, whatever. And I was like, nothing oh. wrong with that. No, not, not just you know, <laughs> relative to my friends. And I was like, all right, I gotta, I gotta start hitting the gym. And so I did it for you know external reasons. And then I recognized the benefits of it. And well, yeah. 17 years later, like 
my girlfriend and everyone around me knows like I am an unhappy human being if I do not go to the gym. And it's not even like a, a decision for me anymore. It's like, I am going to the gym, period. Like yep. there's no, like, and you know, I do have my days where I'm like, oh, I don't right. know if I want to go, but I always go. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's like eating. I'm just, there's yeah. no way I'm going to skip it, you know? And, you know, I get up 4.35 o'clock every day. I have my same morning routine and I go to the gym. Like, yeah. it's just, it's like clockwork to me. And it, it calibrates my entire day. Yep. And you know what? I'm not always 100% in there. I'm not always on it and loving it. But like when I leave, I'm never disappointed that I went to the gym. Yep, yep. And that, that is the one piece of advice I do give people is I say you wouldn't miss a work meeting that you have scheduled every day. So just put it in your schedule that you have to go to the gym at this time and you can't you can't miss. You got to treat you it like just work. Just showing up, that's half the battle. Yeah. If you make yeah. it to the gym, you'll never be disappointed that you went. Period. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, so I want to go back to this idea of entrepreneurship because it's something I think about a lot because I went to law school with so many people who, you know, they're bright driven people and they just, they didn't know where to go after college. And so a lot of people just go into law school because they, it, it's kind of, you don't have to take prerequisites to get in. It's not like medical school. So it's something you can kind of easily decide to do at the last second is go to law school. And then you graduate in three years. By within three to five years, so many people I know are completely out of the entire practice of law because they just they didn't actually want to do it. It was just just the thing that was there for them. And, you know, I wonder there, there you hear like schools doing all this different stuff, trying to teach entrepreneurship, trying to get people to start their own businesses like and I see you shaking your head. And I, I'm kind of with you on that, which is like I, I want people to find their own thing and find the thing that they love, that they'll be productive in, that they'll enjoy getting up and doing every day but i don't think you can teach that in school right no, how do you I feel remember, about that I, I had a college professor and don't get me wrong i love the college of charleston it provided me with everything but this one class he was teaching entrepreneurship and he had never started the business <laughs> exactly right. and i was just like how like you wouldn't teach german if you couldn't speak german like right. there's I, I just and it it aggravated me so much. I was like, you have never started a business. How can you? And he's like, well, you know, and I'm like, no, not well, you know, you don't know. You have no idea. Right. And so it's kind of like that Rodney Dangerfield movie where he's like, well, what about the money to grease the politicians? You know? And he's like, yeah. what are you talking about? He's like, well, that's how you run a bit. You know, it's like, it's this hilarious, like real world experience. I want to hear the nitty gritty. Like, yeah. how did you almost fail? How did you succeed? Like, were you up crying at night? Because a lot of entrepreneurs are. Like, that's yeah. the shit I want to hear you go through. And, you know, I, I was thinking back as you were talking through this, you know, without my dad and the direction and support he gave me, I, I don't think I would have found my entrepreneurial path as quickly. I would have found it eventually. But I think something for me growing up that was just like instilled in my head, my dad was so positive about like, you can do anything you want. And I know a lot of people say they're told that growing up, but like every single day of my life, my dad was like, you're awesome. You can do anything you want. And I, I believed it. I was yeah. never told anything else. I was very fortunate to have a super healthy home. And I just think that like, I, I know that, and I've, I've told people this all the time, like the number one message that I'm instilling in my kids, other than hard work and respect and love your family is like, but you literally can go do anything you want to. And no one can tell you no other than yourself. And of course, there's limiting factors around that about raising capital and having right. reasonable expectations. But this world is limitless, man. I've seen some people come from nothing and create billion dollar companies. And I really wish more people would bet on themselves every day and take that leap to make that step because there is so much opportunity in this awesome country we live in. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you 100 percent on that. Do you feel like that there has to be something paired with that? That, like you said, the idea of you got to work hard to be able to get that because it seems like it's. I I, I hate being like the old guy, like oh the younger generation, but it, it's like you you meet these people who who think they can do anything, but you know they they want they want the success that you've had without those years of putting in that hard work and and of failing. And but, does there need to be a balance when you say you can do whatever you want? Yeah, well here's the thing too. I always tell people this all the time. If my whole world went to hell in a handbasket tomorrow, I'd be the best damn barista you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> yeah, like, I, don't I, doubt I, have, that. I have no shame. Like you, you got to start somewhere. And I, I've heard people be like, well, like I'm too good for this entry level job. I'm, I'm like, no, you're not like BS. I've worked 
every job you could imagine as a kid growing up and in the storage space and this and that like and I feel like just now after a decade like of pushing that flywheel my company's finally seeing the results of a decade's worth of effort and and of course people see the deals we're doing now and the industry volume we have now which is great I'm very happy for it but they don't see the first few years where I had no idea what the hell I was doing and I was driving 50,000 miles a year in my car for five years straight, trying to land any owner that would talk to me and trying to figure out packages and deals and debt structures. And like, I, I had no idea what I was doing when I started my company. Like, and people don't see that. And I don't want other like startup companies to be afraid to share that. Like, yeah, it sucks. And it's, it's difficult, but it's so worth it if you put it in and you take those calculated risks, but you have to take those baby steps to get there. Like there's nothing wrong with taking the entry level job out of college or law school. Like, take it, do it for a year or two. See if you like it, save up some cash, build your battle plan and then go launch your venture. Like it's definitely not going to happen the first time. And it's definitely not going to happen overnight. Like Absolutely. you have to be ready to weather the storm because it will happen. And it it's going to be rough at points. And you're going to seriously doubt yourself as you're riding this emotional roller coaster day in, day out. But it is so worth it. Yeah, talk to me about what it is that your company actually does, because you're not you're not building the facilities, right? You're helping match buyers and sellers of facilities. Yeah. So just like you would hire someone to buy or sell a house, you hire us to buy or sell your storage facility. So we go out, we build a package, we market it to a wide swath of buyers uh, throughout the U.S. and abroad, um, and we help you negotiate those terms and come to a deal. Um, so we kind of we hold people's hands through that process, and you know. Unlike a house, you might move or buy or sell like four or five homes in your life. Most storage facility owners, they're a single owner operator, one store, you know, they've owned it for 30, 40 years. And we are there to guide them through the one time they're going to do this in their life. You know, for a lot of guys, it's, you know, Farmer Joe in Eastern North Carolina who happened to build a $3 million business. And he, this is his retirement plan. This is his everything. So we put a lot of effort into getting this done right, getting the right valuation on it and guiding them through this process because it's, it can be very complex, very challenging, and it's a very drawn out process. You know, most of our deal cycles anywhere from, you know, six to 18 months. Um, you know, we've had 30 day closings, but it's just rare in storage. Yeah. We've got big buyers, big debt pools, um, complex deals to work on and, it can be exhausting, but that's, we're here to help them weather that storm and make sure that they get the best price and the best buyer for their property. You said something that I actually do want to be taught in schools. You, you said Farmer Joe was able to build a $3 million business. That's what I think people don't understand about entrepreneurship is that you can, you can be really, really successful just by starting something in some little industry or little field that you know and growing it. How, how, if, if, if I grew up not with an entrepreneur as a, as a father, not really knowing any entrepreneurs. And I'm just going through school and they're telling me, oh, you've got to, you know, if you really want to make money, you got to be a doctor, you got to be an engineer, you've got to go into finance. How do I learn about, how do I discover the idea that I can just start my own business and be successful that way? That's so I think my one question. Of, one of the biggest things that, and I think Eric, we've talked about this before in the past is the emphasis that America puts on like, and, and believe me, I'm very thankful I went to college and you know going to additional school and program, but like, I know a lot of very quiet electricians and plumbers that make very healthy six figure plus salaries a year. They set their own terms, their own schedule. They have no boss and they make some damn good money. And I think people overlook those jobs because America today has put so much emphasis on you have to go to school and take out a quarter million in debt. And if you don't have a college degree, you're worthless. And I could not disagree with that more. I think there is a lot of value to be derived from school if you want to go in that direction. But I wish America put more emphasis on vocational programs and really showed people that like, hey, you can start your own electrical business or you can start your own GC company. You can start your own landscaping company and make a lot of money. And I think it is just such an overlooked piece of this day. And I tell people all the time, the best thing you can do, no matter what you wanna get into, go find someone who's doing what you wanna do really well and just talk to them, ask them questions. Yeah. And you know what? People are always very flattered and you'd probably be surprised how much they're willing to share with you. 
and might even take you on in a mentor mentee role or hire you and then guide you through this process as you grow. I mean, it, it's not far-fetched to reach out to the number one person in your industry or class you want to do and learn from them. A lot of people are open to that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I have a buddy who grew up doing landscaping work, didn't go to college. He just started his own landscaping business right out of high school. Me, with all my fancy degrees, he is in a much better financial position than I am in. So that's I always use that example. And, and he doesn't he lets me know that, too. He doesn't make me forget that. Yeah, I've got I've got that the Duke and Notre Dame degrees hanging on my wall that, that don't mean shit compared to to what yeah. he's got. So well, and, and I think that's again, and it's you know at an earlier age that's looked down upon, but there's nothing wrong with that. You know what you want to go do? Not taking on a dime of debt. You can go launch yeah. your own company, step out on your own, and yeah, it's different hours and different work environment. You can make a really good lifestyle off that. And yeah. then I've seen people like. I had a friend, very similar, started a landscaping firm, and then he sold that landscaping firm for a very healthy amount of money. And then guess what? He invested into real estate. Now he's just got passive income and then yeah. he goes and buys more. And so it may not be the first stepping stone you want, and it may not look the way you want, but that hard work over a long period of time is going to eventually allow you to capitalize and then pivot into what you do want to go do. Yeah. So like I've had guys, uh, another client of mine, they, he and his father sold, they owned a... Um, waste management line where they're you know, picking up garbage and they sold it to the tune of 38 million dollars and then they went and bought an ungodly amount of storage facilities yeah and so those years and years of That's picking great. up trash and you know having a team and this and that they don't do that anymore yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, that literally brings a tear to my eye like that's the american dream right there i love that and and that's that's I think that's another thing that needs to be taught. It's like you don't have to be doing what you love at 25, but yeah. use that as a stepping stone so that you know, have that plan laid out in your head. And you say, okay, I'm going to be doing this for X number of years. I'll save X amount of money. And then from there, I can go to here. You well, and I think there's a out. happy medium between like our parents' generation of like you have this one job and you put your head down whether you like it or not for 50 years. And I want to go start my own wanderlust company and travel the world. It's like, yeah, there's an in-between. It's like, you're going to have to eat the shit sandwiches at some yeah. point. I, I I don't know any other way to put it. Like everyone's got to do the ditch digger work and just get down to it because that's how you learn. That's how you grow. It's how you earn your stripes, period. You don't do it forever though. You don't have to do the job you hate for the rest of your life. But in order to build the financial base you want or pay off your student loans or get in a position to go take on that next venture, you're going to have to do it at some point. Right. And I think people overlook the the quality of that type of work early on in your life and saving appropriately and paying off those debts to put you in a position to then go really chase down what you want to get into. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to me about relationships because that was my favorite part of of the excerpts of the book that I read is is these relationships that you build and that's something obviously they don't teach you in business school and yeah. but it's such a big part of any industry even you know something again like something like self storage you would think who cares about relationships but but that's been a huge part well, of what you've done. I, so. Uh, I think Eric, you and I can both agree that uh, we could both talk to a brick wall for as Absolutely. long as they allow us. Um, I can always, and have. Yeah, and, yeah, and have. <laughs> um, people always ask me to self-describe. I am a social butterfly. I could pretty much talk to anyone, and I love it. And that's why I wanted to get into brokerage over construction. My, I could do my favorite thing every day. I call people and I talk on the phone all day long. I love it. People get sick probably listening to the fact that I enjoy doing that, but I love it. So for me, it's like, I get to hang out all day and talk to people like, this is great. And it's so much fun for me to connect with people over where they're from, where they've traveled to, what's their background, what languages do they speak? Where's their family from? What are they doing? What sports their kids play? Like, I love that. I just love building relationships and I love connecting good people. And, you know, I got like, oh, I got a friend in this. Oh, cool. I'd love to connect you with my buddy who does this. Boom. They're happy. They're happy. They get a deal done. And I tell people all the time, you just never know when a connection is going to come full circle. I mean, look at you, you left Durham five years ago and here we are doing a podcast together and Absolutely. it's awesome. Like this is, this is what we thrive on is, is being able to connect and bring our passions, our livelihoods full circle together. And it is exactly what has made my storage business so successful for me. And I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, you know, I, I called this one guy starting in 2012 and he was like, Hey John, not interested. Call me again in a year. So called him, you know, once a year, every year for seven years. And one day he called me out of the blue. He goes, you know, John, 
you're the only broker that has called me for seven years straight. And exactly like I said, and we've always had such a great time talking about hunting and you know, whatever else he goes, I'm ready to sell my store and I want you to do it. And like, that's, that's why I do what I do. It takes yeah. time. But if you're willing to invest in building those relationships, you never know when it's going to come back full circle for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what I do with this podcast is there's people who I've wanted to talk to and I'll email them or send them a message, won't hear anything back. But then I'll talk to someone that they know and I'll have a great podcast with them. And they'll say, oh, you know, I should put you in touch with so-and-so. I say, oh, yeah, you know what? I've been trying to talk to them. And it, it, all these things that you don't – you can't consciously plan out, but it's just enjoying talking to people and being around people – builds on itself that that yeah. if, if you're an interesting person a nice person a fun person to talk to that makes other people want to talk to you well i think it's you know in high school and even earlier in that your parents always like you know be nice to everyone you never know you know right but it's so true and i think it's something that i always i don't think i intentionally did grant but i just i have like i've got a dozen different like friend groups i i just again i talk to a brick wall so i just i love connecting good people yeah. love talking to people and i love growing myself and learning and, and wanting to adapt and it's just such a fun industry for me to do it and i've been very fortunate a lot of my clients are also in industrial or tech or you know whatever i've learned about so many asset classes i never thought you know like waste management never thought i'd learn a thing about waste management i learned more than i'd ever care to know but then that gives me another tool to go have a conversation piece with someone else next time i hear it come up i mean you just never know when you're going to be able to utilize your network and how it can play out for you in the long run. So the biggest piece of advice that I could give people is not, not only be nice to everyone you meet, but you never, ever know when it's going to come back. Yep. And I don't mean that in like, you should just kiss ass to kiss ass, but you know, form a genuine relationship with people and do good by them. They will do good unto you and it will come back to you. I absolutely can promise you that. Yeah. It's funny that you brought up high school clicks because I, I work with some high school students and you know they'll they'll come with me with their problems and they, they say that exact thing about about you know I'm well I'm kind of friends with this group but the, but you know they don't like this group and I, I want to be friends with a kid in that group and I say listen be friends with everyone be friends yeah. with everyone don't be in a group it's it feels like when you're that age you need to be in a clique you need to be in a group but when you get older what really pays is being friends with everyone and being able to connect the groups I say be the person connecting those groups you and your friend get get your friends from those two groups together and you realize you've got things in common, even though you don't think you do. No. And, and I think it goes so far into that. And, and, you know, being able to draw those connections will help you not only personally, but professionally as well. And, and again, Hey, if you want to go start a company, your friends with everyone, it's gonna be a lot easier to raise capital than if yeah. you're not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So tell me about, tell me about those early years when you were having like those tougher times and you know, people weren't answering your calls. How do you get through those tougher times? So I, you know, when I was first calling facilities, you know, I, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just like, Hey, do you want to sell your storage facility? Right, oh no. Right. Okay. Bye. Sorry. Right. I, I felt, I felt awkward, like calling them. And I remember like, you know, it took that first couple deals where someone went out on a limb for me and they're like, yeah, we'll let you, you know, take us, take a whiff at it. And, and a lot of, you know, fumbling and mumbling through awkward sales pitches and this and that. But I just always knew that if I kept like pressing through it, I would eventually get to that next point. And I yeah. thrived off of the small wins. And I think that probably stems back to like sports and you know, being an athlete growing up, like not every game is going to go well, but you're going to learn something from everything. And as long as you know that like there is a, there is an end all be all of it. Um, and I, it's really about just showing up every day. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that God, that sounds so cliche. I know, I, I know, but, but it's, it is it's true. I mean, I'm telling you, we're getting old that these, these I know. cliches I that we like would laugh there. at a couple of years ago. You're like, Oh, now I get it. Now it makes sense. Well, it, you know, again, it's literally like the number of clients that I've won over the years, they're like, you know, I'm going to go with you because you're actually the only broker that's followed up with me for eight years. Like, I'm not saying my job's easy, but like, sometimes I get listings like that. It's also not that hard. Like, I, I just, I just did what they asked me to do. I called them back every six months for eight yep. years. And guess what? I'm the only one who's still here. Like, it's outlasting. It's like game of survivor out with outlast outplay period. Exactly. You know, like exactly. that, that's, that's the key to it all. And I think it's just understanding before you go into any venture, it's going to be a roller coaster, emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, financially, like saddle up, build a really good personal network. Something that I, I advise to everyone, whether they're going to be an entrepreneur or not, is to build a personal board of advisors um, for different categories of your life. 
and for me, I, I, I mentioned a minute ago, but that's emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, and financially. So pick someone that you admire, whether out of your friend group or in your network a little larger and, and ask them to be on your personal board of advisors. And people are going to be flattered. No one's going to tell you, no, they don't want to do that. They might say, ah, oh, you know, maybe I'm not right for that. You'll find someone who does and use them as a life barometer, use them as a coach or as a friend to check in with them and continually go to them for the good and the bad and the ugly, yeah. because you're not going to have great wins in all those categories every day, but it's important to be grounded with someone who you see as a, as a guiding light or compass in that category and be able to go to them constantly through good and bad times to use as a soundboard as you continue to grow as a human being. Yeah, and I think when you do that, you get surprised at how much people are willing to help. I think people do, when they see that there's someone who's passionate, who's curious, who really is really seeking guidance, there's a lot of people out there who are willing to help as long as you put yourself out there. Absolutely, and you know, on the note of putting yourself out there, you know, I again, I'm, I'm not a very bashful person. Right. So those people that are you know, a little nervous about starting a company or making contacts, don't be. You'd be surprised what you can get by picking up the phone and calling. And I remember... I, I always tell the story. I was like 23 and I was having trouble getting a hold of public storage, the largest publicly traded storage company in the world. They're worth billions and billions and billions of dollars. And so I found the head of acquisitions on LinkedIn and I messaged him and I said, Hey, would you guys be willing to sell me your location on this road in Durham? Public storage doesn't sell anything. They haven't sold anything in like 40 years other than like maybe one store. They got 4,000 locations. Like they're, they're the, that's like, it's like emailing Apple and being like, Hey, will you sell me part of your company? Right. He, he, he messaged me back and he's like, in all my years, I've never had anyone <laughs> ask me that. And I, and then I got his phone number and now we're best friends. Like yeah. now we, you know, we've done deals. Oh, that's and talk. Right. But like, I caught his attention. Like yeah. you just never know, like shoot your shot. Exactly. Like the worst is he says no, or yeah. it doesn't get back to you. Like, right. exactly. you're not going to die. Like yeah. it's not the end of the world. And I think people forget, like I, I get people that call me all the time with sales pitches. They, they might call me a week. Later. I don't remember them calling me a week ago. even. So right. if you bomb a call or a pitch, like it doesn't matter. Just right. Go on to the next one. Someone's right. going to see what you're trying to do and help you go build that ship. But yep. don't don't be bashful. This is yeah. this is not a life for the for the shy people. Yep. Well, I, even with what I do, people ask me all the time, like, how do you get guests for the podcast? I say I just email people I'm interested in. I you know, like I read their book and I find their contact information or they're doing something interesting and I send them a message. And a lot of times people don't get back to me and that's fine. And I'll I'll do what you do. I'll follow up every every so often just to say, Hey, you know, I'm just yeah. still interested or I'll say I, I did this interview with someone who's in a similar field. Just want to show you. I'd love to talk to you about what you do, but even even when I messaged you, you know, I saw you're coming out with a book, and I'm like, oh, that'd be really cool to talk to John about his book. And but I was like, uh, you know, I haven't talked to him in a couple of years. I don't know. Is it is it weird for me to just reach out to him out of nowhere? And then I was like, I'm just gonna do it. And if he says, I yes, think I replied instantly. You did, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, right. You were excited. That that gets me excited. It's, right. And but you gotta you've gotta be willing to just say, okay, the worst thing that happens is like you said, yeah, they don't answer. That's it. They, and you've got to just be okay with that. I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. It's just, you can't put too I much mean, emotion got, into getting an answer from everyone. You got to be able to take some licks. You exactly. Know? I mean, that's and and it's and I think it's part of kind of the 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 fault of some. I say kids. God, that makes you sound. Old. <laughs> I'm telling <laughs> you. I'm, we're, I'm telling days. you. We're old. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, oh, I'm not accepting this job. And I'm like, listen, like you got to start somewhere. Like it's okay. Like and yeah. and I tell I'm learning every single day. Like I am. I find out new things every day and I'm like, man, I'm, I'm really dumb. Like I gotta you know, work on this. And like, and I tell people, I try and step out of my shell. Like I, I feel like a little kid, but like I, 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 I'm always, I'm three languages I'm working on right now in addition to English. And like, I'm always trying to like step out of my comfort zone, you know, get comfortable being uncomfortable. And yeah. uh, I tell people all the time, if you hadn't read any of David Goggins books, go, go get weird, learn how to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. I think that's one of the best pieces of advice I could do or I could give someone is just, just take the step. It's not going to kill you. Yeah. You'll, you'll grow from it. You'll be fine. Take a couple ice baths every now and then you'll be good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Learn to get uncomfortable yeah. before we go. Just tell me about the idea for the book. Where, when did you say, Hey, I got to write a book. So I write every morning anyways. And I said, you know, uh, I have all this time during COVID. It'd be a great time for me to, to capitalize on all this, but I really wanted to, to paint a picture from our experience in the industry. Say, Hey, here's my trials and tribulations in the industry. And this is why I'm the best person to help you sell your company, period. 
you know, we, we've done a lot of work, whether abroad or domestically with, you know, getting new, new bills pushed through, uh, political efforts on a national scale in the industry. And I think we just have a unique background having built, bought, and sold storage facilities over the years to be well positioned to help single owner operators maximize their value at sale. And I want to be there for them. I want to be a lifeline for it. I want to help people sell their life's work for the top dollar they can get. And I want to show people through a book that I'm the one they should work with. So it was really opportune. We've had a great you know, decade in the business, and I want to be here for another 40 years. That's awesome, man. The book is called The Sexy Side of Self-Storage. When will it be officially released? So the link for pre-order will drop April 1st. Okay. You can get copies in hand first week of May. So as soon as I get that, I'll fire it over to you. We can get it rolling. Um, in the interim, if you want anything about us, you can go to our website, lindsayselfstoragegroup.com. Awesome. And I've read excerpts of the book. I got a sneak peek. It's excellent. I can't wait for the whole thing. I'll be there on the, the pre-order list. John yeah. Lindsay, thank you so much for your time. I know you're making the media rounds today, so I'll let you go. Thanks, I, re I appreciate really appreciate it. it. And right. we'll go. I was going to say, we got to go more than five years before talking next time. Of course. Hey, well, you <laughs> less than five years. I said less than five years before talking. <laughs> you can call me anytime, man. Thanks for having me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Of course. I appreciate your time. See ya. Thanks, dude.